In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We'll be continuing our series there. And remember that this story is directly after King David has been anointed. Of course, he's not king yet. He just now got anointed by the prophet Samuel. And so we're going to see sort of the fallout and the reaction to that. And that takes place in 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 18, which reads, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you, let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when an evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play well, and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician and a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. This is our first real introduction to David's character, because we do see his introduction at his anointing, but we don't really learn anything about David the person. We know a little bit about his appearance and what he looks like because that is somewhat addressed earlier, talking about him being handsome and with beautiful eyes and ruddy. That's the only description that we have. We don't know anything about his personality, his likes, his dislikes, any of that, until we get to this particular passage of Scripture. And the first thing that it introduces us, the first little bit of trivia that it gives to us so that we can sort of get an idea of who this character of David is, is that he is a handsome man that he is somebody that is thought of as a warrior, and he plays a harp. It's important to note that we do find out a little bit more about this warrior stuff later, when he talks about slaying a bear and slaying a lion. And of course, he hasn't fought Goliath yet, but that is to come to pass soon. But nonetheless, here we see the description of David as being a attractive person, a skilled musician, and a warrior. So, in a lot of ways, David is the warrior poet. That's sort of the archetype that he fits. He's the kind of guy that, sort of like, you know, how samurais used to write haikus, or you heard about cowboy poets. This is the kind of person that he is, and this tracks with what we learn from him for, throughout the rest of Scripture, that he's not just a skilled musician. He actually writes music. Most of the book of Psalms was written by him. And then we also see that he is, is someone that is skilled in, in words, lyrics, poetry. He's uh, an expert at playing music, all of these things. He's apparently a good dancer, we learn, interestingly enough, later in the scripture. And all of these things sort of culminate in the fact that he is also a warrior. So he's not a sissy. This is a tough guy. And we see the skill that he has with a blade and, and with uh, just making war in general. And yet he has this really sort of sensitive side to him. And you can kind of see, just based on this personality and this description that we get, why David gets a lot of chicks. I mean, <laughs> that's probably not the most reverent way to put it, but he does. David has several wives. He's apparently somebody that's very attractive and alluring to women, and we kind of understand why. I mean, he's not only a tough guy that can handle himself and could protect a woman, but he's also very poetic. He has a poet's soul. He has that sort of artistic vibe about him. And we also learned that he's a good-looking man. So you can see here why women would just go nuts over somebody like King David. Uh, he's sort of the archetypal man in that sense. Somebody that balances the spiritual strength with the physical strength. And, and you know, the physical stuff is just, I guess, icing on the cake. But the question here is, it seems as though that God's providential spirit is working here. That seems to be pretty evident based on the scripture that it's so odd that Samuel would just happen to get a wicked spirit. And then the solution that his servants just happen to come up with is, let's find somebody that's really good at playing the harp. 
And then all of a sudden, David, who is going to be the next king and needs to be put in a position to where people could recognize him as the king, just happens to be a very skilled harp player. And he's the one that these people just happen to have come across and suggest to Saul that this be the guy for the job. Obviously, all of that is not a coincidence. Obviously, what has happened here is that God has worked in some way to make all of these events unfold. But we're not told exactly how in so many words. Did David acquire his musical talent from God? Well, the answer is yes, because we acquire all of our talents from God. But the question is, did he acquire it specifically for this cause? Probably. That's not necessarily something that directly correlates to being a good servant of God. You obviously don't have to be a good musician to do that. But God never leaves us ill-equipped. It seems very intentional that the things that God, that God has given David, the gifts that he possesses, just happen to be all the gifts that he happens to need to be in the right place at the right time to do God's will. And God does exactly the same thing for us as well. Now, to me, this is the more difficult question. It says God sent an evil spirit? That seems pretty out of God's character, doesn't it? Why would God send an evil spirit to torment Saul? Well, first of all, it's important to note that when it says evil, it doesn't even necessarily mean evil. And also, when it says sent, that could be read a couple of different ways. There are certain things that God allows to happen but doesn't directly do. I mean, the reason that evil exists in the world is because there are certain things that God, though he might rather it not exist, allows for its existence. And so it's very possible that the evil spirit is being allowed to torment Saul by God for, some, for the reason that we're seeing here. We actually see this in other places as well, where God's providence works there in where uh, Jesus cast out spirits or uh, when the apostles cast out spirits and, and the entire town believes at one point because they cast an evil spirit that has the power of divination out of a girl, that kind of thing. And so we see that even though God doesn't control necessarily or force the evil spirit or send them directly, we can look at other passages of scripture that show that God just kind of allows some of those things to take place to serve his purposes later. Now, it is a little different here because it seems as though based on the Senate structure that there was some activity on God's part, but that could very easily be read as just something that God allowed to happen. But if he had sent it, and it wouldn't necessarily be an evil spirit, but one that just, I guess, taunted Saul or made him feel bad or, or directly punished him in some way for what he's done. Would that be unjustified? No. It's not uncommon at all for God to directly punish people. I mean, normally he does it passively, but we do see instances in the scripture where God punishes people in a very direct way. I don't think that it would be outside the realm of possibility for God to allow this to happen as a punishment for the sin that Saul has, got, has done to serve his purposes later in, in David becoming king. But my question about the blessings, kind of going back to that question for a second, is this something that God bestowed upon him? Or is it something that was enhanced? So did the Spirit like impart David's talent at the harp? Or did he just enhance the talent that was already there? Now, ultimately, all of that talent goes back to God at one point or another. But I guess I'm just asking when that talent took place and, and when God imparted it to him. Now, is it something that has a whole lot of deep spiritual meaning? Probably not, because God being the source of it ultimately means that the spiritual message is going to be pretty much the same regardless. But it's just something that I personally find fascinating because everything that David had, whether it was his talent with a harp or a slingshot or at keeping sheep or at slaying giants or fighting people on the battlefield, ultimately that all came from God at some point anyway. But it's also important to note that even though that God gave David all of his talents, even though he was there with him every step of the way, even though he was the one that set all these events in motion to where he could eventually sit on the throne one day and fulfill God's will, David was not God's plaything. In fact, we see many instances 
over the course of time, where that is not the case because David actually defies God and does things that God would not approve of. So David wasn't an automaton, even though he was a very good man and a man after God's own heart. And we also see that he's not just like some kind of favorite that God prods around like we see out of Greek mythology and how their gods dealt with people in their time. That God is a loving father that cares about David, cares about Saul, cares about everybody involved, but understands that for the most people to come to an understanding of him and his will, that the best course of action is to allow David to now be king because Saul has proven himself unworthy of that title. And so, yeah, God is going to use David, and he's going to use them in great and wonderful ways. I mean, eventually, this is the person whose seed will produce the Christ who saves all of humanity. But ultimately, it was because that's what David wanted. If David hadn't wanted that, God would have found somebody else. God's not manipulating David into doing these things. He's offering him help here and there along the way. But God's not forcing David into anything, nor is he trying to sort of, you know, coerce him. Ultimately, this had to be done because it's what David wanted, and God understands that. So yes, he gave him what he needed, he gave him aid when he needed it. So he gave him good equipment and he gave him help along the way, just like he does to us. But he's not going to force anybody into doing what he wants. God just doesn't do that. Which means that if we want to be one of God's people, it takes a great deal of intentionality on our part. Yes, he's going to be there to help. Yes, he's going to give us the things that we need to do that, but ultimately it comes down to do we want to be God's servant or not? David made the choice to be God's servant, to use his talents and his blessings and the things that God had given him in a good way. Occasionally, he used them incorrectly and was punished greatly for them, but ultimately those decisions remained with David, and the same is true today. If we want to be the kind of servant that David was, just like David, we have to be intentional with the blessings and opportunities and providence that God offers us along the way. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.